to our presenters now who, are, who have traveled here to TZ to be with us. We're going to begin with the renowned Sheikh Abdullah bin Baya from Mauritania, who's now residing in the Saudi Arabia, where he is a scholar at the King Abdul Aziz University. Sheikh bin Baya is founder and president of the Organization of Promoting Peace in Muslim Societies and has been a vocal advocate against violent extremism couched in Islamic terms. His efforts recognized most recently by President Obama in his speech at the UN General Assembly this week. Translating for Sheikh bin Baya is Khamza Youssef of Zaitina College. Sheikh bin Baya. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. Allahumma salli wa sallim wa barik ala Sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa salli ala Sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala ikhwanihi min nabiyin wa mursaleen. Ayyuhu al-Sayyid al-Fadila, ayyuhu al-Akhawat, Sayyidat wa Sada, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. My distinguished introducer and all of the distinguished guests, um, peace be upon you. Awalan, ashkar al-wazart al-kharjiya al-filandiya al-lati qamat ala hadha al-amal wa ashkar al-markaz al-salam al-ma'ahad al-salam al-amriki al-lati نظم هذه الاجتماعات على The first thing he wanted to thank uh, the Ministry of Exterior from Finland and also this Institute of Peace for, for uh, bringing about this forum, uh, important forum. السؤال الكبير هو إسهام رجال الدين في السلام قضية السلام هي تحد للبشرية منذ وجد الإنسان على الأرض كان من مشكلاته الكبرى السلام لأن البحث عن الثروة وعن القوة هو من طبيعة الإنسان فكان هذا سببا للحروب جاءت الأديان والفلاسفة والأخلاقيون والعقلاء لإيجاد حل لهذه المشكلة لمشكلة الحرب في قلوب الناس مشكلة الاعتداء مشكلة القتل من عهد آدم من عهد ابني آدم المعروف قابل وهابل بدأت المأساة في كل زمن فيه تحديات تفضل نعم so uh, he said that the big question that we're addressing is the role of religious leaders uh, in terms of addressing the problem of, of violence and extremism and and he said that violence has been a, a human challenge from the very beginning of, of our uh, species um, we know that uh, human beings uh, have uh, a need for resources and so sometimes that need uh, actually confronts other people's uh, needs and so people clash over uh, resources and this ends up in this, this violence. And so we ha we've had in history uh, religious uh, leaders and then philosophers, uh, uh, people of intellect that have attempted to address this problem at a deep level so that they um, could, could help uh, solve this problem and bring about peace. And, and he said that this is a problem that's, that resides in the hearts of people, um, this problem of uh, violence and, uh, and extremism. And he said in, in our foundational story that, that we have about uh, the first people, we have the story of Cain and Abel. And this is a story of uh, violence. And so it's, it's at the root of the human condition. فرجال الدين هما في هذا السياق 
عليهم مسؤولية خاصة هي مسؤولية الطبيب طبيب الذي يعالج المجتمع المريض يقول أحد الفلاسفة أحسبه نيتشة يقول إن الحضارة تمرض وأطباؤها هم الفلاسفة إذا المجتمعات الآن والحضارة وبخاصة في الشرق الأوسط مريضة ما هو رد الفعل الذي يجب أن يقوم به رجال الدين هم ليسوا قادة عسكريين لينزلوا إلى الميدان لإيقاف الحروب هم ليسوا قادة سياسيين so he said that the uh, in in this context there's a huge responsibility that religious leadership has uh, it's the responsibility of a physician really because if you look at our civilizations uh, particularly uh, now we see in the middle east that the, there's a, there's they're not well they're sick and he said that uh, that a philosopher i believe it was nietzsche uh, said that s civilizations uh, become sick and uh, the the treatment plan has to be at the hands of philosophers and uh, yeah. Yeah. he said uh, I think it's Nietzsche who said that um, so, <laughs> so, so he, he said that uh, that this that that the illness has to be addressed by people um, of, of intellect يعني فننظر إلى دور رجال الدين في هذا يبدو أن فيه الفقرة لم تترجمها وهي أنهم ليسوا قادة جيوش. Uh, نعم. Uh, so he he noticed I didn't translate something. Um, <laughs> so he's very fluent in French. So and he follows my translations. Um, but he he uh, he said that the uh, religious leadership are not military leaders. They don't have the capacity to go in as a, as a, a military force and, and stop these conflicts. ليسوا قادة سياسيين أيضا لاتخاذ إشراءات سياسية ترضي الناخبين. And he said that there are also not political leaders that can take political decisions that uh, please or, or, or otherwise their uh, political constituents. ليسوا لهم ناخبين هم. He's, he said they don't have people that elect them into power. He said these are people that what emanates from them is based on their spiritual and their ethical uh, uh, positions. وكما قالت الأخت التي تكلمت قبل قليل قد يكونون في ظروف صعبة. And he said, like that was said by the previous speaker, that sometimes they're in incredibly difficult conditions, and yet despite those conditions, they rise to the occasion and do what they can. So here we have to look at what is this treatment that we can put forward in or from the religious leadership in order to treat this problem. He said uh, primarily this is a treatment that addresses the intellects, the hearts and the emotions. هي أن نعلم الناس. Our approach is to teach people. هناك مثل إفريقي. We have an African proverb. يقول إذا وجدت القردة مريضا فبسبب بسبب دقيق أو ثمرة ثمرة دقل يعني نوع شجرة في إفريقيا باو باو يعني شجرة في إفريقيا وإذا أردت أن يشفى فزده من هذه الشجرة. He said we have a pro African proverb. There's a monkey that eats a fruit from the baobab tree, and the fruit makes it sick. But the treatment is to give it more of the same fruit. فنحن أيضا نزيد الناس نعلمهم الدين زيادة. So he said that the treatment here is not is is not less religion, but actually more. 
but they need to better understand their faith. Because, because these people actually, it, it's out of a religious ignorance that they're doing what they're doing. They have very shallow understanding. They use some uh, decontextualized uh, verses and things from religious texts. And, and their own uh, interpretations and explanations. And also some historical examples. So this is a, uh, really a, an ed edifice that we need to deconstruct. It's, it's this current of violence. So we have to build uh, that which will confront this, this uh, current. And and, and, and put forward so we have to put forward uh, intelligent responses and uh, correct understandings that will address uh, the problems so at this stage, he feels that the, the why is, is not what needs to be addressed in the immediate circumstances. That as the previous speaker mentioned, that there are conditions that bring about uh, these, these uh, problems. But right now, the focus should be on how to address the immediate problems. It doesn't mean that we neglect the why. The why is important. But in, in, the, in the immediate circumstances, it has to be how do we address this, not why did it come about. And so we always put forward in our methodology three questions. What, why, and how. But we begin with how. It doesn't mean we neglect the other two. We have a fire that we need to, to attempt to put it out uh, before we can get into the causes of the fire and who started it. Sometimes it, it, the, the problems are too complicated and when we can't even really get to the actual whys. There's uh, victimization, there's grievances, poverty. Yes, yes, thank you. لكن نحاول أن نقدم فرصة السلام لتكون مناسبة لحل تلك المشكلة. But we want to put forward the opportunity of peace because the opportunity of peace is the appropriate environment that we can address these other issues. وهذا موضوع نقاش كبير بين المفكرين في العالم الإسلامي. This is a big area of debate amongst uh, intellectuals in, in, the, in the, the Muslim world. They said, how can you talk about peace and you're not addressing the grievances? My perspective is that war is not what is going to solve the problem of the grievances. He said that now the means by which people engage in war is very different from the previous period. These are uh, weapons of mass destruction and, and, and much more destructive. We have to address the grievances by other means. كانت كان قال إنه إذا لم تكن العدالة فلا يكون السلام كتابه عن السلام الدائم. In perpetual peace, Kant talks about that 
without the, the, uh, the philosopher Kant talks about without without justice uh, there can be no peace which is a very common slogan people hear he said that's true you can't have Kant or Kamen? Kant, 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 Kant. You can't have Kantian peace. Kamilan, uh, sorry. Okay. You can't have complete peace. It's close, Kamil Kant. <laughs> but it's more important from his perspective to have peace so that we can. Uh, address the problems of justice within the context of peace. We, we need uh, the dialogue of civilizations. Uh, a, 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 a societal dialogue. This has to be, a, 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 the whole society has to engage in this dialogue. The men, the women, the youth, uh, the religious leadership, political leadership. So that we can really uh, examine the alternatives to war. Aflatun that, that Plato said that the dialogue is the means by which we, we find alternatives to war and that war is actually the failure of a civilization. Platon. No. So, so our approach might appear to, to be complex, it, it also might appear to be a long-term approach, but if enough people are convinced of this approach, then we can, uh, we can work towards engendering peace. He said, we, I believe that all of our religions, but in particular the religion that I speak uh, on behalf of Islam, has within it uh, mechanisms for promoting peace. But I want to uh, draw attention to a point. Religion is like a power. Energy. 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 It's an energy. This energy is able to be So you can use that energy to, uh, to facilitate the, the water and bring about life and bring about uh, uh, agriculture and, and greenery. But you can also use that same energy to develop weapons of mass destruction that uh, can annihilate us. He said this is exactly the problem with our religions. So the, the people that carry the religion, they're responsible for how they use this energy. So our approach is to use all of these means within our religious tradition to promote peace. And also to reveal the sophistical nature of these uh, arguments that people are using for the opposite approach. 
بما فيها تلك الذرائع التي قد تكون مفتراتا ليست موجودة. Some sometimes they use means that are actually just completely fabricated that have no real basis or source. أضرب لهم مثلا عقدنا مؤتمرا قبل خمس سنوات. Just to give you an example, we had a conference five years ago. حول فتوى لأحد العلماء في القرن السابع الهجري أي قبل سبعة قرون. We have a a fatwa from somebody who's from the eighth century. هذا العالم اسمه الشيخ ابن تيمية. His name was Ibn Taymiyyah. هاي الفتوى اعتمد عليها مجموعة الجهاد في مصر. عبد السلام فرج في كتاب له اللي يقول إنه يجوز قتل المسلم قتل كل المصريين يعني. So this fatwa was used by there was a a ideologue in Egypt, Abu Salam Faraj, who actually used this fatwa as a foundation for a small book that he wrote, arguing that Muslims and Muslim rulers in Egypt could be killed because they weren't following the the Sharia. And and Sadat was assassinated based on this fatwa. هذه الفتوى هي فتوى محرفة منذ مئة سنة. And this fatwa was actually uh, the, the 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 fatwa ha had a misprint in it f f because of a printing of over a hundred years ago. Uh, there was actually a misprint in the fatwa that came out. And this fatwa was also quoted by Al Qaeda in their uh, declarations over 150 times. منذ مئة سنة حرفت الفتوى في طبعتين طبعت. So there were there were two editions, one in in Riyadh and one in in Cairo, and both editions had this mistake. So when I heard the fatwa when we were addressing the issue in Mardin, in Turkey, which is where the people who asked him for the fatwa were from, he I brought together a group of scholars just to discuss the fatwa. But during that discussion. I, I looked at it and realized that there was a problem with the fatwa and actually said there's something wrong. I don't think uh, Ibn Taymiyyah said this. So when we got back uh, to Jeddah, we actually asked somebody from uh, Syria in, in Damascus and there's a, a mektaba, a library there that's known to have the oldest, some of the oldest manuscripts. We got one of the oldest manuscripts. And it was the only one. And we found that what I had pointed out on the misprint was actually accurate. That the, in the original uh, handwritten manuscript, it, it was it was uh, it had a completely different word. So we, we showed and then everybody agreed, even though they didn't agree at the time, I'm adding that, but everybody agreed later that the fatwa was indeed misquoted. It was a misprint because the actual word it said yuqatal, which means you know that the ruler could be killed or fought or you attempt to kill him, whereas the actual word was yu'amal, that he should be treated uh, of, of, appropriately, which is a completely different understanding. He said, this is a small example. الجيش ليس محاربا نحن الحرب التي نقولها هي حرب سلام. He said we 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 really need to to have a an army of scholars and I'm not saying an army I'm using that metaphorically we need an army of scholars that can address these issues. لبث هذه الأفكار. In in order to disseminate these ideas. نحتاج إلى فضاءات. We need space spaces. Where these ideas can be disseminated. The, the scholars, they need also security protection because they're being assassinated. Libya, no, that's Libya. Libya, no. So in these places like Somalia, Nigeria, Libya, Syria, many places, Yemen, that the scholars that are speaking out now against these positions, they're actually putting their lives into jeopardy, including the Sheikh. يجب أن يوجد تعاون بين العلماء وبين 
السلطات العاقلة. So the, 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 there has to be some type of cooperation between the scholars and between the peoples in authority, uh, the, the intelligent people uh, in authority to do that. ليس معنى ذلك أن العلماء سيقولون ما تقوله الحكومات. And that can't mean that the scholars just say what is pleasing to the governments. ولكن هناك قدر مشترك. But there has to be some agreed upon area where they can work together. والسلام. And that's peace. هذا الذي نسعى إليه. This is what we're engaged in endeavoring to do. وقد التقينا بعلماء من نيجيريا. We met with scholars from Nigeria. عقدنا اجتماع يومين حول هذا الوضع. We had. التقينا بعلماء من السومال قبل ذلك. We we had a gathering for two days and then we also had a forum uh, with the scholars from Somalia. And then in the recent uh, forum, we, had, we brought together 250 scholars from all over the world to address the issue of peace. And they agreed upon the declaration that, that uh, we put forward. And that declaration is online. We don't have the media channels. ليست عندنا إمكانات الانتشار في العالم. We don't have the capability to to spread these things around the world. لكن مع ذلك سنحاول. But despite all of that, we'll continue to do what we can. وشكرا. Thank you. Shukran Jazeera for your insights and for your courage, Sheikh Finbaya. And I hope our friends at Google and Facebook and YouTube are all listening to that last part in particular about the need to, to work with technologists to spread this message far. Our next speaker, Pastor Esta Ibanga, unfortunately couldn't be here with us today because of some travel difficulties. But we didn't want to lose her voice and her insights in our discussion, given her remarkable and courageous work she's doing on the ground in Nigeria as president of Women Without Walls Initiative in Jos, Nigeria, which is a place in Nigeria which has witnessed quite a bit of violence between militant Christian and Muslim extremist groups. So she kindly shot a video presentation for us to air today. So I could ask my friends in back to please screen it. Hello there, I'm Pastor Esther Ibanga, and I pastor Just Christian Missions International here in Nigeria. And it's a privilege to be part of this conversation. I'm sure it's been a great um, meeting. It's a pity I'm missing it, but uh, well, we hope next time it works out. The nature of extremism in my own context that I understand, having worked um, as a religious leader in my own community and in my own state and country, is that um, you, you have someone who believes um, um, his opinion is superior to any other, you know, and as such, you are naturally would be intolerant to any other opinion that it's not, you know, um, similar to your own opinion and um, the nature of such extreme either opinion or ideologies or whatever it is you know uh, that makes people be extremely passionate about what they believe in and how things must be done the, the, the nature of such stand is that it always looks for ways of expression now I'm not saying that um, it all the time leads to uh, terrorism, but the fact that you know you have such extremist views on a particular issue, naturally it's like a bottled up, you know, um, paint up, you know, um, a bottle of coke under the sun, and the moment that coke is lifted up, it just busts out. So there's very little that triggers such, you know, opinions. And most of these extremist views can be destructive, they are exclusive in nature, and they claim to have superior knowledge, uh, they're standing on something else that no one else knows, and their opinion 
is better than anybody's and of course that naturally will lead them to absolute intolerance of any other opinion that contradicts um, their opinion. So basically we're talking about um, how that affects you know, um, family units and then the society at large. It is very important that we also um, address the issue of injustice. You know, most extremist views have a feeling that, um, you know, they have not been given fairness. And so there's a sense of injustice that justifies whatever that extremist views now results in. And so um, that sense of injustice needs to be addressed. And I must say that as religious actors, we really do have a challenge, particularly female religious leaders, because you'll be surprised that even in the religious circle, first of all, there is very little platform for, um, for example, women that can participate and actually have their voices heard. Um, it's a male dominated area, even in religion. Uh, most religions do not believe a woman should actually speak. So it's actually a challenge for a voice or the voice of a woman to speak strongly on the issue of extremism. And uh, I also think that one of the challenges we face as religious leaders is the fact that you can only counsel them and you can pray for them, but you can't force them. So if somebody is holding so strongly to an opinion or a view, you know, you can only counsel. You can only try to make the person see the other way, but you can't force them. Some, think that, some of them are actually born with that belief system. So, you know, there's only so much you can do. And like I mentioned about the strong male voices, I really think that um, platforms should be created for more female voices. Number one, their mothers, their sisters, their daughters. There's a way a woman perceives and ministers that's different from a man. And I also think that um, outsiders can help by creating more platforms where religious actors are actually involved in decision-making process. That is really, really important. Um, when policies are formed and made, you know, um, religious leaders are totally exempted from it because they feel that um, it is totally outside the, the mosque or the church. But I also think that they need the input, uh, so to speak, the guidance from a spiritual perspective. We're all spiritual beings as it is. And in the long run, there are principles that guide us. The Bible guides every Christian in the way he or she lives. And I think that even on a government level, uh, when um, policies are being made, religious actors should actually be included, you know, to offer, you know, um, guidance as to how some of these laws, because if you look at the Bible, most of the laws in our constitution that is even taken from there. And everybody believes thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not steal, and so on and so forth. So where there is a common ground, I, I think that that should be um, utilized. And I also think that in the place of um, you know, uh, resolving conflicts and talking about reconciliation and things like that, uh, it's very important to involve religious actors. You may not always um, have that influence um, outside of the church or the mosque, but to the level of influence that you have within the church and the mosque, it should be adequately utilized. How outsiders can help religious actors? Well, um, they can support them, you know, and in the place of training, and in both religions, I, I think, and also being exposed um, to different platforms um, to enable them and equip them and empower religious actors to make use of the influence they have over followers.
positively, more positively. And I think that also religious actors should also be um, examined, you know, on their own to make sure that they don't hold extremist views, you know, because, you know, you give out what you have, you know, and if you're already an extremist yourself as a religious leader, then you're not likely to, you know, um, encourage tolerance and acceptance of the differences from other people. So I think that um, the government can help, the society can help, and in recognizing the role of religious leaders in actually influencing the lives of their followers positively. And I think that that should not be taken lightly at all. Well, these are just um, my views, and I hope that um, you know you have a great meeting. I look forward to hearing the rest of this conference, and have a great time. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Our final speaker is a dear and old friend of mine, Vinya Aryaratna from the Sarvodia movement in Sri Lanka. Uh, Sarvodia is a Buddhist faith-based organization that's guided by Gandhian principles of nonviolence, promotes poverty eradication, and peace across ethnic and religious divisions. And Sarvodia has sought to empower religious actors to serve as agents of peace and coexistence in the country particularly in the midst of multiple forms of violence. Dr. Vinya is a doctor by training, but a peace activist at heart and by practice. Vinya. Thank you, Susan. Uh, Sheikh bin uh, uh, Baya. Uh, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. I'm deeply honored and very humbled to be uh, a part of this distinguished uh, panel. Uh, I speak as a lay Buddhist, a practitioner who is connected to the Sarvodhya Sramadana movement of Sri Lanka, which is by far the most uh, uh, widespread grassroots development organization in the country, which is based uh, uh, on Buddhist and Gandhian principles as uh, 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 mentioned by uh, uh, Susan. We work across all ethnic and religious communities in the country and we have a history of working in Sri Lanka for more than 50 years now. Sri Lanka is a country which, has, uh, which is now emerging out of a very violent conflict which lasted for more than 30 years. And um, today though the war is not there anymore, we are trying to rebuild our country which is a multi-ethnic, multi-religious society. And um, we have also experienced violent extremism in Sri Lanka from during the last uh, three to four decades. The more prominent one has of course been the ethnic strife that had affected our country for, more, for nearly uh, three decades. But there were also other insurrections, youth insurrections, very violent insurrections, twice in our history, which had also claimed the lives of hundreds and thousands of youth which belonged, who belonged to both ethnic communities. Now I would say that religion played an insignificant role uh, in, in those conflicts compared to what we, uh, some of the recent trends that we see in our country today. Uh, we have seen during the last few years uh, action, uh, actions by certain uh, Buddhist uh, monks who have taken up a confrontational stand against the Muslim community in Sri Lanka, which is very unfortunate. And this has also resulted in serious riots recently and where a number of lives were lost and also significant damage to livelihoods and also to property. It's not my intention to go into a deep analysis of the causes, effects and possible solutions to the varied forms of violent extremism that we see or the trends of violent extremism that we see in our country, but how to reflect on how ordinary people um, uh, read this situation and what we are trying to do to promote peace and harmony in our part of the world. I also draw from the experiences that were shared during our deliberations from yesterday with my colleagues who also come from uh, some uh, countries which face similar challenges. Now ethnic and religious identity uh, really form an integral part of our society, particularly in Asia. Religion has played a very important role in building not only the culture but also social and economic systems. Now, 
whilst I would call them those uh, 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 religious ethnic determinants or drivers as internal, um, our deeper consciousness is uh, shaped by our history, the way uh, history is narrated in our textbooks as we were taught when we were children and also how today the mass media portray religious and ethnic identity. So in, in a very highly charged context that we had to operate today compared to maybe 20-30 years ago. Um, this poses a great challenge to multi-ethnic, multi-religious and multicultural societies such as ours in a very increasingly globalizing world. So when uh, it is claimed that uh, Sri Lanka as a Buddhist country, predominantly Buddhist country but which has um, uh, all ethnic and religious communities living uh, and um, uh, which is now seeing these uh, alarming trends of increased uh, organized violence against certain ethnic groups. But by and large Sri Lanka has been a model of religious harmony and if you visit Sri Lanka even today, what you see, what you witness is more of religious coexistence and harmony than animosity. Now, use of ethnic and religious identity to mobilize one's own community against another community uh, has been, uh, in my view, used as a political tool. It, uh, this has also been emphasized during our discussions from many participants based on their country's experience that religion has been captured or taken over. It has been framed. So it's not really religion which is driving uh, youth and certain groups into extremism but larger political interests. So this is an important factor we have to consider. Now how do we address this trend of extremism and radicalization? At the outset, I would like to say that extremism and radicalization cannot be or solely uh, or primarily addressed through a security doctrine only. There are enough examples. Now, in our context, we see three important fears of influence that are important. One is what we call the psychosocial dimension and we call it the consciousness. Consciousness is the way how we think collectively as individuals, as communities on various things that affect our lives. Our identities are formed through this consciousness and this collective psychology uh, and what we have accumulated over the years as, as part of our culture and values. And it is at this level that the religion and religious actors play a very important role or had, has the most influence. Then secondly, it, is, it has to do with physical needs or what we call economics. In a situation where young people do not see a future for themselves or for their families uh, and there is uh, fertile ground for external forces to exploit. If people's basic needs are not satisfied and if there is unequal distribution of wealth, income and resources then naturally that's a breeding ground for extremism. This results in a sense of hopelessness and which combined with the above mentioned psychosocial factors lead to great vulnerability for young people to be attracted to violent extremist ideologies and organizations. Those are not the only two factors. Then thirdly we have governance or power. We all know that politics is an important driver. When people feel disempowered, disenfranchised sometimes, they cannot take part in the decision making processes that affect their lives that lead to deeper frustrations and enhance their vulnerability further. To, in, in today's globalized world, local violence is not just driven by local factors. Global policies as well as interpretations of ethno-religious identities may even provide legitimacy to some acts of extreme violence as we see in our part of the world today. We therefore believe that any action to prevent or combat, combat combat violent extremism should be an integrated, holistic and multi-level approach that addresses psychosocial, economic and political determinants. Now coming back to our own experience in Sri Lanka, we have been constantly and in a systematic way have attempted to address these issues for several decades, even at time when we were facing a very bloody war. And we have also come up with innovative and sometimes very rapid action to address sudden eruption of violence. Therefore, early warning systems, the religious leaders as well as those secular organizations which 
can identify these trends of violence early and can act, it will make a huge impact in combating or preventing violence. Now at the level of con consciousness, our work primarily involves facilitating greater understanding of one's own religion. Uh, the religion is misinterpreted. Now Buddhism is a very, very uh, peaceful uh, uh, religion which is uh, uh, which promotes ahimsa, non-violence in every aspect, thoughts, deeds and words. However, it has been interpreted by certain groups in a very different way. Therefore, we also have to understand not only our own religion but how we relate to other religions, particularly in a multi religious multi-ethnic society. So we have been involved in not just uh, education in, of our own communities but also relating to other uh, uh, teachings of other religions and we have researched and published books for children, youth to learn and understand basic religious teachings of other uh, traditions. Sometimes they are simple storybooks. They have been published in both Sinhala and Tamil languages, the languages that are mostly spoken in Sri Lanka and distributed throughout the country. They have had a tremendous impact of promoting understanding. We also recognize the important role played by the religious leaders themselves and also other religious actors. Interfaith dialogue and understanding has to be promoted. Now, sometimes we are being uh, criticized for promoting interreligious activities. Uh, however, if you prepare the religions and religious leaders first to look at their own religions before they have interreligious dialogues, then I think we can have a very big impact. During the last three years, we have organized such programs involving hundreds of religious leaders, which include training and capacity building. We see now a disconnect between sometimes the traditional religious leaders and younger generations because they cannot readily relate and interpret the teachings of religions in a way that is relevant to the present day generation's needs and aspirations. So there has to be a certain facilitation to build capacity and to get them to be equipped with certain skills that are required that may include communication skills, understanding uh, how to use certain types of technologies, how to use multiple uh, uh, sources of references and so on. So interreligious committees and councils consisting of Buddhist, Hindu, Muslim, Christian clergy were formed and during the recent riots we have seen that these groups acting together somehow spreading, uh, somehow stopping the spread of violence to other areas particularly serving as even like firewalls and it has been so effective and we think that we can really on one hand have primary prevention that is prevention of extremism emerging in the first place and at other times trying to detect such trends early and taking early action and these uh, multi-ethnic multi-religious councils have been able to effectively uh, stop violence from spreading to many parts of the country when we have witnessed such violence in some isolated uh, locations so the important driver is really the consciousness but at the same time we have to also act on the other two uh, spheres which is economics and governance. Economics also traditionally our societies have been shaped, even our economies have been shaped by certain principles that are found in our faith traditions. Uh, we have Buddhist economics, we are certain principles of sharing, how our economy should be organized around the principle of uh, justice, equality, that is very important. Today our per capita income as a country is very high. We are a middle income country. We are no longer a poor country. But the income distribution is so skewed that it is, there are so many disparities and even, even if you take certain basic indicators such as nutri malnutrition or even infant mortality rate, health and social indicators, the national indicators are very good but then you see uh, vast disparities uh, between districts and regions. Therefore, it's very important to address inequities and every religion has uh, uh, certain principles how you should organize your uh, uh, economics or how systems should be organized at community level to satisfy basic needs of people. We need to have the religious leaders and religious actors reflecting on those 
economic principles as well and that can also affect uh, policies. Lastly, the aspect of governance. We all know that we would like to be part of decision making, of decisions that affect our lives. The principle of subsidiarity. Has it been really practiced in our country? Most of the violent groups or the groups of uh, say youth who are attracted to uh, extremist groups have felt that they, they have no part in the decision making. So basic principles of democracy by way of forming community organizations, get them to be involved, get them to be part of electoral processes, local government elections, uh, uh, promoting um, dialogue where you can influence policies at multiple levels. Those are important interventions that can also uh, prevent extremism and radicalization. Now, what can religious leaders do in that context? Now, we have formed these smaller uh, groups of, or committees which are really looking at social issues at a local level, which brings together religious leaders and also representatives of organizations which have a spiritual basis and that has been very effective. Those have been very effective in expanding the democratic space for various interventions. So finally, what I would like to say is that uh, religion has been used as a tool for division, whereas all religions uh, do not preach division or hatred or violence, particularly in our society where civilizations have been built on faith-based traditions. We need to do much more. We can't take it for granted anymore. We have to come together, particularly those of us who are working from the civil society uh, organization with uh, drawing inspiration from great uh, religious traditions. We need to work together. But our local actions can succeed only if external drivers are also promoting harmony and uh, promoting coexistence at ground level. Therefore, those policy makers who are uh, working at international um, uh, policy making institutes should also take into consideration that we have to uh, work together in a common framework where we support each other rather than undermining each other's work. I would like to thank the USIP for giving me this opportunity and I assure you that we all would continue to work at grassroots level. We have to bring bridges. That is why we have many uh, who come from, uh, the country, uh, from the grassroots who are working together and we have to draw strength from each other because sometimes even our, um, our uh, lives are in danger because we have to uh, really work uh, with certain forces which do not uh, believe in uh, uh, non-violent uh, conflict resolution or peace building. Thank you very much. We have about 20 minutes to open it up for question and answer and I ask that you form lines. There's two microphones halfway up the auditorium so if you can form lines behind them. Um, and while you're doing that, because Syria is so much in the news, I also invited my colleague Hind to say a couple words. Um, about the work that's being done with religious actors in Syria as well. And just to warn you guys, our group is going to have to leave, I'm going to have to end this precisely at noon because um, our group is going to be going on to the hill for Juma for Friday prayers. So bear with me if we're not able to get to all of your questions. Thank you. What I'd like to do is collect four questions. If you could say your name, say your institution, and then please ask a question and keep it short if you can so that we can get to as many as possible. Go ahead. 
Hello, I'm Ali Mohammed. I'm a student at the American University. I'm an international student from Egypt. Uh, my question here is addressed to uh, our distinguished Sheikh. Uh, we know that the role of rel religious uh, leadership is mainly for educating and uh, enlightening the general public. But they also have a role, which is advising the, those in power. But now we have a very serious uh, issue, which is a lot of uh, the religious scholars stand side by side by the, uh, those uh, dictators and uh, undemocratic regimes. So how can uh, our scholars you know, restore their credibility and the trust of the people in their ability to make a difference and promote peace? You know, because we want them to discuss uh, the very causes of the issue, wh uh, which is extremism. A lot of youth nowadays, especially in the Middle East, they don't have a chance uh, to be part of the decision-making process. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Can we collect two more questions and then we'll... Please go ahead. It should be on if you just speak into it. Many thanks to USIP for hosting this important issue. Uh, my name is Yasser Zidan. I'm a graduate student in the Institute of World Politics. Uh, uh, my question is uh, uh, for uh, Sheikh Bimbiya. Uh, it has been always an important role for, important role for uh, uh, religious leaders in Muslim countries to, to reform and take deed. Uh, but the problem is that there are some uh, religious texts that hasn't been uh, more uh, organized or uh, interpreted, uh, like uh, some some hadith in Sahih that has to be uh, misprinted, as you said, the, the example of fatwa. Uh, also, uh, such example, such the, the example that you said about uh, the fatwa of uh, Sheikh Ibn Taymiyyah. Uh, uh, this is the first time I heard about it. Uh, why this isn't uh, published in a uh, more wider way? Thank you very much. Thank you. Peter, why don't we do one more? Go ahead. Yes, Peter Kovach, uh, retired Department of State diplomat and interfaith activist. Uh, I can't resist uh, having Sheikh Hamza uh, up there with our two distinguished guests, and thanks to USIP for pulling this very important discussion together. Uh, asking for a comment on the role of interfaith seminary training uh, in this peace building capacity. Thank you. Thank you. The last question was about interfaith seminary education. Interfaith seminary education, the role that it plays in peace building. You can speak to it. it yeah, the, I think I'll answer the last question. Uh, um, we have been uh, promoting the interfaith uh, uh, dialogue mainly, and also uh, connecting the religious leaders from different faiths to their lay followers. That's a that's a very simple uh, model. Um, That's good. <laughs> the other questions we had were on uh, the focus on governments, the promotion of nonviolence instead of peace, yeah. and yeah. then. نركز على عدم عدم العنف أو نشر السلام يعني فهمت. Did you? I mean, she's saying on basically how you frame. It's how we frame it. How we frame it. Putting the focus on not resorting to violence as opposed to advocating for peace. يعني أن لا نستخدم العنف أو أن يعني ننشر السلام. 
وال يعني السؤال يضع مقابلة بين شيئين هما متكاملان في حقيقتهما. He said that the uh, the question is really putting two sides of the same scales um, that they complete one another. فعدم العنف هو السلام. He said not using violence is also uh, peace. طبعا هناك فيلسوف يقول إن السلام ليس انعدام الحرب وإنما السلام هو الأخوة بين البشر هو الأخوة التي تقوم في القلوب. So there's a philosophical opinion though that peace is not simply the absence of war but rather uh, the fellowship of humanity that people uh, have in their hearts a sense of human solidarity. لكن عندما نريد أن نتكلم عن السلام لا بد أن نتكلم أيضا عن إيقاف العنف. So when we want to speak about peace, we we we're speaking about it also because we have to speak about ending the violence. لأن السلام لا يعني لن يكون سلام و في وفي نفس الوقت حرب الحرب هي والسلام لا يمكن أن يكون معا. You, you can't have peace and, and war together. They're, it's, they're opposites. صحيح إذا أمكن أن نوقف أسباب الحرب وأن نزيل أسباب الحرب هذا هو الأساس هذا أفضل شيء. The, the best thing is to remove the causes of war. That's obviously the ideal situation. هذا أفضل طريق. And that's the best approach. لكن إذا لم نستطيع فعلى الأقل نحصل على سلام تدريجي سلام ناقص. But if we can't do that, then at least we have to get a a, a peace that is incomplete. In other words, it's it has uh, shortcomings. ليس مثالي. And, and, and it's it's not the ideal situation. And sometimes we have to do that piecemeal. وليس مثالي. It's not the ideal situation. لكن مع ذلك نحن لا نأس. علينا دائما ان نتحرك نحو السلام ان ندعو الى السلام. So we, we, shouldn't, we shouldn't despair, we have to move towards peace. في نفس الوقت الذي ندين فيه العنف وندين فيه الظلم. At the same time we have to condemn violence, we have to condemn uh, the extremism. وهذا اجابه على سؤال الاخر الذي قال يعني ان رجال الدين لا يدينون ما تقوم به الحكومات. رجال الدين يدعون إلى الحق وإلى السلام وإلى رفع المظالم. And that also addresses the question that was raised earlier by uh, the young man about uh, the uh, these uh, despotic rulers. That it's a responsibility of religious leadership to speak the truth, to address grievances, to remind uh, people in power of their responsibilities. يوجد تفاوت طبعا. بين رجال الدين في فهم قضية السلام. So there's obviously levels of understanding amongst religious leadership about this uh, problem of peace. في منهم من يقول uh, مثل كانت uh, رجال الدين الإسلامي ككانت أيضا بعضهم يقول العدالة أولا. So there's some who say justice first and no peace without justice. لكن نحن رأينا في مجتمعاتنا أن إذا قلنا العدالة المطلقة أولا مع رفع مع ارتفاع سقف المطالب إذا لن يوجد سلام. But from my perspective, if we say in the current conditions no peace without justice, then uh, given the amount of grievances that we're dealing with, let's forget about peace altogether. فلهذا يجب أن يقوم السلام في القلوب حتى نتحرك نحو العدالة. So we have to get peace established in our hearts so that we can then work towards addressing the grievances in peaceful environments. نضع السلاح. Putting aside the weapons. كما قال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم من رفع من حمل علينا السلاح فليس منا. Our Prophet said whoever uh, holds up a weapon against us is not among us. Not one of us. Thank you, Sheikh. Sheikh Yusuf, do you want to speak to the Interfaith Seminary The question Interfaith Seminary. I, you know, I think one of the crises um, in, in the Muslim societies 
I mean, I'll give you an example. Sheikh Abdullah bin Bayya comes from a tradition um, that really is over a thousand years old. And what's really fascinating about his approach is that he doesn't, he's not a modernist. Um, that his approach is actually drawn from uh, the, the, these, these deep sources within the tradition itself. Um, and uh, the Ottoman uh, example is a really interesting example because the Ottomans had a multi-faith society that was based on uh, a, a man, the, their first uh, ruler, uh, Usman the first, who actually had a vision of a massive uh, sycamore tree coming out of his breast. He had a dream where he saw a massive sycamore tree coming out of his breast and all of the religions were in the shade of that tree. And this was something that uh, the Ottomans were very, very proud of, the fact that they protected all of these religious minorities, that within the traditional Ottoman system, the religious minorities what was called the millet system. They had their own court systems. The Jews had their own court systems. The Ottomans built synagogues when the Jews were being persecuted in Spain. And Bernard Lewis, uh, a great uh, Jewish uh, scholar from the United States, uh, points this out in his book that the Ottomans not only invited the Jews to migrate to the Ottoman lands, but they built synagogues for them. And that's why some of the most beautiful synagogues that you'll find in Eastern Europe were built by Ottomans, not by Jews. Um, that this, these sources that we have, the con convivencia in Spain, where the Muslims, the Jews, and the Christians live together, people forget that during the Muslim rule in Spain, uh, the, the Muslims never got to over 50% that they ruled a country that was still uh, a majority of Christians and the Christian churches were um, preserved. That the, the, the fact that we've lost so many of these communities, this is one of the great scandals of, of, uh, of Muslims in human history. What's happening in Syria to these Christians who have been there for 2,000 years. I mean, these are some of the oldest Christian traditions that we have, the, the Nestorian, the Jacobite, the Malachite traditions, uh, these are ancient Christian traditions. The Malibari Nasranis that are in, uh, in uh, India, these were ancient uh, Christians that were persecuted by Orthodox Christianity uh, and, and yet lived in the Muslim world. The icons during the iconoclastic period in the Muslim world, the only icons that we have during the iconoclastic period where the Christians went and burnt all the icons uh, that, that was a short period in, in Orthodox history, but the only icons from that period are, the, are from the monasteries that were protected by the Muslims. And so Muslims traditionally understood this, that, that, that there was a responsibility toward uh, religious minorities, and this unfortunately is from the massive ignorance um, that, that uh, the religious ignorance that we have, and that's why Sheikh Abdullah, his argument, you know, Jonathan Swift said, we have just enough religion to hate one another and not enough to love one another. That's a very apt truth for our age that we have forgotten, um, as uh, was pointed out about the axial face, that they came in a time of immense religious, uh, uh, immense violence and conflict and were actually introduced uh, to remove that. Karen Armstrong in A Prophet for Our Time about the Prophet Muhammad argues that his central thrust was to create uh, a peaceful environment on the Arabian Peninsula because there was so much uh, violence uh, and vengeance. So we're, we've fallen back into this pre, uh, uh, what they call the Jahili period and I think if we don't address the, the madrasa issue and real enlightened uh, uh, religious leadership in all of our traditions because we know that we have Jewish extremists uh, that teach uh, a horrible form of Judaism um, where, where uh, people are seen as less than human in the, in the Holy Land. That doesn't represent the great tradition of Rabbi Hilal and, and other of the great religious enlightened leadership from the Jewish tradition that says the, the whole foundation of the Torah is to love God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. And everything else is just commentary. And so, uh, and the same with uh, Christian fanaticism and Buddhism, which has uh, a nonviolent uh, PR. But if you study Buddhist uh, tradition and just study what the Buddhists did to the Muslims when they reconquered Afghanistan, I, I encourage you to read the Clause of Buddha, which is about religious violence within the Buddhist tradition. So, Buddhism has 
uh, a history of violence also. So that all of these religions, like the Sheikh said, they, they have violence and they have, uh, they have the potential to eliminate violence and it depends on how we use them. Thank you. We have five minutes, so if we can take these two questions and I'm going to ask a closing question as well. Thank you. Uh, Ali Al-Mawlawi from the Embassy of Iraq. Uh, I'd like to ask the distinguished speakers whether they see a difference um, in terms of root causes between sectarian-based conflicts and conflicts between religions. Uh, in other words, um, should there be a different approach in terms of intrafaith dialogue and interfaith dialogue? Thank you. Thanks. Hello, I'm Mahreen Farouk from WORD, the World Organization for Resource Development and Education. I wanted to thank all the speakers, especially Sheikh Ben Baya, for um, your excellent comments and particularly uh, your fatwas against violent extremism. Our organization, WORD, has published a number of reports on the importance of engaging religious actors, but often we find that Western governments are hesitant to engage these actors and they're slow to um, address the need to build the institutional capacity of religious networks. So my question is, how can we work to overcome and address this challenge? Thank you. So the first question is on the difference between doing intra-faith and interfaith. Intra-faith, whether the root causes of those conflicts are different and require different avenues to solve. The second was about overcoming the reticence that the Western governments have to engaging with religion. And the final question I would like to add is similar to that. It's uh, some of this reticence I know comes from recognition that Western governments working with embracing some of these actors or Western organizations like the U.S. Institute of Peace doing so can delegitimate them or put them at risk. So my final question too is what can we do to help without making your life at risk or making your, life more, your work more difficult to achieve? The first question. Uh, are the approaches different from when you have inter and intra uh, religious conflict? So if you look, for instance, in our region, in the Middle East, you have uh, in Iran and then Lebanon and then to Yemen, you have this problem uh, between the Sunni and the Shia. <laughs> and then you pass through uh, Syria and Iraq. Uh, and then also when you look at uh, Israel, the state of Israel, for example, you have the same problem. So in Egypt, for instance, you have a problem of within the, the Sunni Muslims there, one group says that they, what they're doing is the right way to the, the way that a country should be run. And, and, and they're saying the other group is, is wrong in that way. So they have different 
uh, understandings of, of, of how they're... So some people use the term secularist and Islamist. I don't, I don't really see a real demarcation uh, that's clear to me to make those type demarcations. So for me, the approach has to be based on the, 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 uh, a dialogue that, that emanates from a serious dialogue that emanates from a desire for understanding, and then also looking at the shared, um, uh, the shared um, interest, thank you. Yeah, the shared interest. My brain's starting to fag here. <laughs> <laughs> no. and, and also the, from the, 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 the broadness or vastness of these religious traditions. So the Shia can live their way and the Sunni can live their way. The, the, مخزون السني كبير عشراء المئات عشرات الملايين مخزون الشيعي كبير فهي حرب لا فائدة لها. So if we have war and 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 if you look at the 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 human resources in the in the Shia amongst the Shia the human resources amongst the Sunnis these are endless. So uh, if there's going to be war, it'll just uh, be perpetual. وبالتالي هذا لا مصلحة فيه للدين ولا لي and in reality, there's no interest here, there's no benefit for either the religion or for the, the nation. So these so-called victories are t temporary victories. He said, now we're talking uh, based on reason and, and, and political considerations, not really uh, speaking from a religious perspective. So we say there's no benefit in these wars. And just to add that, you know, uh, Sheikh Abdullah is really, for me, he's, he's one of the unique people in Muslim religious leadership in that he's been, he's been, he's been a minister, he's been vice president of a country, so he, he can... <laughs> <laughs> he, he, can see, he can see from both sides of the fence, which is unfortunately very rare, and it is an actual problem that we have amongst a lot of the religious leadership, is they, they really don't understand the difficulties involved in governance and, uh, and the problems, especially with states that are either failing or, or have already failed. <laughs> So there's nobody has a guarantee that they're going to be victorious in, the, in these conditions. So this is the approach that we're taking to remind these people in the region. If, if you uh, expel these Christians from your communities, you're criminals in doing so. This is before Islam. Thirteen hundred years ago, there was a, a one of the rulers, Muslim rulers, wanted to remove Christians from the mountains in Lebanon. And Imam al awzai one of the great scholars of that period, uh, prohibited, and he said, "You can't do that." And so he stopped. Yeah. And this, is, this indicates, this story is a clear indication of the importance of the religious leadership to be involved in these decisions that can sometimes be um, negative. So the, the, they need to understand these rulers that they can't solve these problems alone. في الغرب أو في الشرق. either in the east or the west.
They have to engage the, the religious leadership. Emanating from both a, a rational point of view, uh, but also a moral imperative. And this is an engagement that's possible. It's, it's a cooperation that can, can be realized. So we need the tools and, and the measures that can be taken. And, and to keep moving forward, progressing. Thank you. Vinaya, do you want to say a last word? The last question, uh, it's about the Western government's engagement with uh, religious leaders. I think uh, in recent years there had been a lot of positive trends. Uh, we have seen institutions like the World Bank, the United Nations engaging in a very formal way. And there are networks like Religions for Peace. I think the lesson is that we need to rely on existing institutions and their uh, enormous experience in engaging with the, with the religious leaders. Sometimes these institutions really try to reinvent the wheel. I think that's not required. There is a knowledge base. There are, there are tools that have been developed. So there, these governments can always rely on those experienced institutions, networks we have, which have really uh, supported uh, the interreligious work and also promoted uh, conflict resolution on the ground. Then on, on the last question about how, how best can, can you support uh, you know, those groups which are working under very differ, difficult conditions, again it depends on the context, you know the countries, different countries have very different conditions. They are again listening to those actors, you know what are the best ways in which you can support and strengthen without jeopardizing them. Uh, how, how certain policies of the same government can, can have uh, different uh, effects on the ground in those countries. I think those have to be carefully analyzed and then this continuous engagement with the actors concerned, you can really uh, come up with the best, uh, best strategy. It's, very, it's not straightforward to say this is how you should engage. I think we have to work it out very intelligently, assess the risks involved and I think uh, there have been uh, progress made on those li uh, lines as well. We have generic lessons that we can learn from the countries that we have been working and we have to further develop those uh, uh, tools and then I think we can find the right uh, answer. Yeah, and I would just say too that we had a very fruitful discussion with policymakers from the U.S. government this morning that was, that was very frank and very open and there was a lot of willingness expressed, not, not any reticence at all except for a desire to ensure that the way in which the U.S. government and policymakers are supporting these religious actors doesn't undermine their legitimacy or their efforts or put them at risk. So friends, there's a lot of bad news in the media, but we know that that's not the whole story. There are also these good news stories of Buddhist monks in Myanmar who are opening up their monasteries to, perfect, to protect um, Muslims, of the Muslim communities who are speaking out in protection of the Christian communities who have lived in the Middle East forever. Let's keep, forever, for 2,000 years, let's keep telling these good stories. Let's share them on Facebook. Let's put them on YouTube. Let's share them with our friends. And on the way out to help you do so, um, Sheikh Bin Baya has provided some party favors. He has a copy of the fatwa that he put out recently condemning ISIS and its violence, and bringing up uh, Islamic uh, tenets and hadith and Quranic passages that, that challenge some of their notions, as well as his book, The Culture of Terrorism. So please join me in thanking very much our speakers for the work that they do and their reflections with us.